Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking about ancient Greek bread with Josh Nudell. First, though, a couple of new patrons. We want to say a great big thank you to William Rolston and to BJ, both of whom have become patrons in the last month. We really appreciate your support. Thank you so much. Woohoo! So yes, today we're going to be talking to Josh Nudell, and this interview was recorded a while back, but I think you're going to find it quite fascinating. I know we really enjoyed chatting to him about this. Indeed. Josh finished his doctorate in ancient history from the University of Missouri-Columbia in 2017. In August 2021, he started a position as a professor of history at Truman State University in Kirksville, Missouri. He works on political culture and identity in classical and early Hellenistic Greece, with particular focus on Ionia and the Greeks of Asia Minor, as well as on political rhetoric and cultural memory. But, as you'll hear, he's also very interested in the material culture and economics of food in the ancient Mediterranean. We spoke to him last summer, so forgive any out-of-date references. And without further ado, let's turn to our interview. So hi, Josh. Thanks so much for coming on. Welcome. Th thank you for having me. This is going to be a lot of fun. All right, so we'll get right into it by asking our basic opening <laughs> question which is we like to talk about unexpected connections and maybe slightly strange ways that people get to the things they're passionate about. And I know that of the many different things that you work on, one of them is bread. And I would be interested in hearing how that became bread and baking and how those things became not only things that you're interested in, but things that you do scholarship on. Yeah, so that's a great question. Now, the, the thing about bread... The first thing to recognize about bread is just that I like bread. And, and, and <laughs> That's my kind of answer. <laughs> it, 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 it's just that they, it, it, at some level, it's that simple. So I grew up baking bread. My father and my uncle actually worked at a, a bakery. My mom was involved as well. And it was actually where, while he was working at this bakery that my father met my mother. And th this was back in the 1970s. And so they were, were baking, you know, when I read, I, I read a lot of food history just for fun. And one of the books I read as food history last year, the year before, was this book called Hippie Food. And <laughs> one of the things that this book talked about was the rise of artisanal bread bakeries. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is that not only was the bakery that my parents worked at name dropped in this book in Ann Arbor, Michigan, but also a food co-op in my hometown where I grew up was mentioned in Vermont. And so, you know, I was just sort of surrounded by this food stuff. And growing up, we baked. My father taught us to bake at a relatively young age, my brothers and, and myself. And we did pizza roughly once a week. Right. Actually, we ate pizza like twice a week, but we baked pizza once a week. <laughs> and so like I just grew up in this environment where there was a lot of food and I learned how to bake on my own. I carried this over. So even when I was in college, I was I was baking and then I came to graduate school and baking just sort of took off. And I would say it took off for two reasons. Number one, I'm just very competitive. And since both <laughs> of my brothers were baking, I was baking more. And so when they transitioned, they, they live in the Bay Area, they transitioned more and more to doing sourdough breads. Mm. I transitioned to doing sourdough breads. And I've baked basically exclusively sourdough bread for about five years now. Mm -hmm. And sort of similarly, so at the same time as this was happening, it was a matter of I wanted certain breads that were not really available to me where I was living. Mm. And so I decided I will learn how to make these myself. Of course. And so I <laughs> I just was a baker. I, mm -hmm. I bake multiple times a week. It's a nice stress ball when you have to knead bagels for 15 minutes and it's a very stiff dough. Uh, actually, it's such a stiff dough that in, in the U.S. context, bagel unions 
resisted automation in a way that other bakery unions did not because it kept burning out the motor in the automated baking machine or uh, kneading machines. (laughs) So, (laughs) you know, you know, it was just this thing that I was interested in. It was this thing that I, I did and I was working on you know, various academic topics. Alexander the Great, I started working on my dissertation, which is about classical Ionia. And one thing that kept coming up is that there's a lot of stuff about bread in ancient Greece, Mm -hmm. but there's not actually that much scholarship about bread itself. Hmm. So when I say that there's a lot about bread and, and grains and things, there is a huge amount that's been written a lot of it very good, a lot of it very sophisticated on the grain trade. Mm-hmm. You know, Greece say, the is grain not supply. A... Everybody cares about yeah. that. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And and like this is true in, of Roman history as mm-hmm. well. I actually did a project when I was in college calculating how many ships it would have taken to feed Rome itself, which ended up being very complicated because I had to figure out what percentage of Roman like the city of Rome, grain was coming from which province, which was a a whole nightmare. It was a whole big (laughs) can of worms. So, you know, there's a lot on that. And it's really, really important. This is the majority of people's diet. And bread and grains in particular have a way of providing most of the amino acids that people need. So Mm -hmm. it's actually a pretty good, healthy thing to eat. And then Greece is not very fertile. So they need to bring it in. How you feed Athens? How do you feed this place? How do how does this intersect with Greek colonization? And these are all big economic questions. These are all big political questions. These are super important things. And then I would get into the social side, like what are people consuming? And people will say Greek people are eating bread. But then what are they talking about when, you know, what are the studies into? Well, it's they eat wine, they eat eels, they eat fish. Do they eat meat? The answer is yes, but, you know, it's a little more complicated than a straightforward Mm -hmm. yes. Pork chops on the the table every night. Yeah. (laughs) Right. People are eating far less meat than, than today. But then we get to the bread stuff and people are like, yeah, they eat bread. As if that's just all the information you need. Yeah. Yeah. And so then, you know, I, so I'm just sort of messing around. I'm looking through sources. Uh, one of my favorites who I was using for some work on, on fra- various fragments was Athenaeus from, mm-hmm. from the Roman period. And he goes into at great length, all of these different breads. Right. And it's like, Oh, there's a much more interesting and a much more compelling story here that could combine all of these things, combine farming practices and shipping practices and market regulations mm-hmm. and, and sale and then production and consumption. There's a right. much bigger story here. And we run into limits of evidence. The, this is much better understood in the Roman period and Roman Italy, where there are very large ovens at places like Pompeii and and Mm -hmm. Ostia. But, you know, that's still something that can be explored in Greece, I thought, particularly when that's combined with this sort of picture, the thing that we're always told about ancient Greece, which is that every polis is composed of oikoi, households. And each of those households is supposed to be self-sufficient. Right, yes. But that's not actually the picture that we get. That's not actually true. So... My interest in bread and combining my interest with baking with these sort of bigger questions of like, okay, so what is life in Greece actually like when it comes to bread? Mm -hmm. It seems to me that this is picking up on a theme that comes up quite a lot in when we ask this question of people, which is that some, something in the rest of your life is something where you have expertise. And when you look at the ancient world, you realize that without that expertise, people aren't asking the right questions because they don't know those questions are there to be asked. So when you look at somebody's talking about bread, you know, because of your background, that bread is so much not a monolith and so much not an, an adequate descriptor. It's a, a food category, yes, but it's <laughs> there is no such yeah. thing as bread. Well, I mean, so, and so you ask that... the questions that somebody yeah. who doesn't know those things doesn't think to ask. 
compares to like Carolyn asking questions about horses or right. like various people we've talked to who are just like, you know, people have looked at this before, just didn't know enough to ask the questions that led to these really deep and interesting. I, I mean, I, I totally agree with you. I think that that's a, a huge component of this. And, and on the one hand, bread actually is super simple. Yes. At, at its most basic, bread is two ingredients. Mm-hmm. It's ground up grain and water. Mm-hmm. And, and that's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you have to add heat to it. But I mean, it's got two ingredients and then mm-hmm. you do some stuff to those ingredients. Yeah. But it's not really that complicated. But then it has an infinite variety. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Because, well, you know, we can break down what flowers are mm-hmm. you doing. In ancient Greece, we've got a couple, and they're sort of the ancestors of what we've got today. Mm-hmm. Most of the time, we divide those between two big categories, uh, barley, which grows pretty well in Greece, and then uh, a couple of different strands of, of grain that don't. These are typically the ones that were imported from usually the, the Black Sea region or Egypt. And so these are, are typically speaking better grains then you can can get there. But then you get issues of storage and transportation and sale and, and a bunch of things that, that you run into there. Yeah, cost is a huge component uh, there. So you've got those, and then you've got water, then you've got salt. Salt mm-hmm. is a, a really important component of, of baking. And there's recently been some studies on salt, like new sort of reappraisals of salt in, in mm. ancient Greece, which are fairly important and get into some of these conflicts, say, between Athens and its neighbor, neighbor Megara right. over access to the salt. Right. But then, so like now you're up to three ingredients. Well, you know, do you have a yeast of mm-hmm. some sort? And they were well aware about leavening. We have a couple of accounts of tossing day old bread, which is pro- possibly the actual bread or possibly just the leftover dough into the today's bread because that's going to then facilitate the the grain or you can do it from time you can just let the the yeast from the the grain berry get into it so leavening okay so there's that but then we have a whole range of things that you can add to breads yeah Yeah. and that's where things get really interesting as far as i'm concerned and i brought up the heat also because that actually you know the whole question of ovens versus pan pen frying yeah. or rock or whatever is, is when you talk about self-sufficiency, I mean, this mm-hmm. is something Mark knows from medieval periods, like an yeah, oven. Yeah, and we know from Rome too. The oven is a big deal. The oven is a huge oven. deal. If you yeah. need, if Absolutely. you bake your bread in an oven, which you don't have to, but if you bake your bread in an oven, that is a, like, that's a major social and economic issue. A- a- yeah. Absolutely. And I'm actually really glad that you said, if you, you know, if, if you do, because you don't have to. No. And, you know, yes, the, the Greeks did have sort of a front loading oven that looks to my eyes a little bit more like a pizza oven, than right. like a wood fired oven than, than we would have today. I was called the, the Ipnos. But we also have evidence for things that basically are a tandoor, you know, a, right. a big yeah. clay pot that has fire inside it and you're cooking the breads on the side. And then, as you said, you can just cook it on a hot rock. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that works just fine. And, um, and so baking, one of the, basically, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Yep. There's also some suggestion. I'm not quite sure about this. I think it calls for experimental archaeology. I haven't had time to do mm-hmm. about possibly baking bread actually on spits. All right. Um, okay. So just like o- over like a bannock. open flame. Like a yeah. bannock. And so you can do these things. Mm-hmm. How reasonable, how how easy is it? And then with these ovens, are you keeping the bread out of the um, ashes? Mm-hmm. Are you not keeping it out of the ashes? Are you cooking it directly in the ashes? And, and you know, how long are you cooking it? And actually in, in Athens, you know, you said the oven would be a, a big differentiator. Well, we actually have evidence from Athens. It comes from this Sicilian Archistratus who wrote a gastronomy who declares to us that this man by the name of Theorion brought a, he was sort of a celebrity baker, kind of like a Paul (laughs) Hollywood of his day, that he introduced an oven to Athens and he taught them how to do it. And this, this oven from the slight evidence that we have seems to suggest that you could bake multiple loaves in it at the same time. Right. So a community. Uh, And so it's a time thing as well as everything else. Yeah. 
that uh, it kind of just reminds me of sort of a basic question because I, you know, I, I, I know more about, you know, words for bread in Latin and English mm-hmm. and so forth, but I actually don't know what the, the sort of basic words for bread are in Greek. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting that you said that, Mark, because in Greek, there are a couple of things going on. First, we have a whole slew of words for bread. I, I counted them up one time. I counted, I think it was in the 60s for different <laughs> types of breads. Wow. <laughs> Not basic words for breads, but like this is the bread that, you know, you serve with a uh, lard in it. This is the one that you bake the same way as that one, but it has olive oil in it. Nice. And so we have this whole range of different breads that that you can. And one reason I think that this is the case is that what we're told is that the people who are most fascinated by words for bread are the glossographers. <laughs> that is the people who are studying language. <laughs> And so, you know, we have this whole range of things. And again, most of these are, are plucked from, but we do have a couple of basic ones. And, and really there's two basic types uh, of bread in ancient Greece. There's the art toss and there's the matzah, maza or, or matzah, kind of like the unleavened flatbread that Jews eat during Passover. Right. And the difference sort of is that maza or matzah is cakes, technically, but, you know, sort of low breads, flat breads, and kind of caked up grains that then get baked Mm -hmm. versus artos that are typically um, described as loaves. And so these would be the larger loaves, probably more leavened, possibly with some other, you know, materials thrown in. There's the uh, aquaticus, which is a Latin uh, term, but for sort of a water bread, which is really just a big plump loaf that is leavened and then you get a big loaf partially through the leavening and partially through evaporating water and so the whole sort of thing holds together and you get a nice fat loaf something similar seems to have existed in in greece as well and then you know these things are then divided into hierarchies depending on what stuff you're adding to them and how white are they? How good is the grind of the grain? Because mm-hmm. the whiter, the white bread that we're familiar with today is really taking all the bran out of the grain. Mm-hmm. That was much harder to do in yeah. antiquity. That takes much more elbow grease, among other things. But then the other reason why this becomes, I think it becomes so important to the ancient Greeks uh, to sort of delineate this, is that bread becomes a marker of civilization. Mm-hmm. And we see this as early as the Odyssey, Mm -hmm. where Polyphemus, he doesn't bake bread. Yeah. He's a shepherd. He clearly knows how to make food, like processed food. He's got cheese, Mm -hmm. but he doesn't have bread. And he doesn't have wine. Yeah. And he doesn't have wine. Those are those two markers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So these are a thing of civilization. Mm-hmm. And if you read through Herodotus, where he's talking about ethnography, he ta- starts talking. And one of the things he, he points out about all of these different civilizations is, yeah, they bake bread. Mm-hmm. They make this sort of bread. And in fact, in a sort of a weird case, he, he actually describes three tribes in Babylonia who eat fish that are prepared like Arctos. <laughs> which I'm not quite sure what he's getting at there, but they seem to have kneaded them into sort of loaves and then baked them. Like fish cakes or something uh, weird. Yeah. <laughs> Except that he's using artos. He's not using matzah. Yeah, yeah. But, so yeah. it's not just a cake. <laughs> so like <sighs> And then they somehow they baked them in an oven. Like it's would artos be is that more likely to be baked in an oven then? The loaves? I think I think in I terms feel like of, that would be the better way of cooking. I a think loaf. in the imaginary, yes. Right. Not so always when you he, when you hear art, art toss, that is the case. But I don't know that that actually necessarily holds up all the time. Right. Because mm. people are going to do what they can do. Yeah. Right. And then, like I said, you know, most of the time, once you're getting into specifics, you're actually not talking about art toss. So when you're talking about, mm. you know, the Egyptians, they make art toss. But when you start talking about specific things, you get a whole range of terms for it based on the enriching agent. You Are know, they... What starches, fats, or sugars. Right. How the grain is ground, how you heat it, mm-hmm. what pan you bake it in. 
And so we get a whole range of, of things, you know, the Calabas, that's an individual roll made with milk and, and wheat, the Torontos Artos, which is a cheese loaf for, for children, the <laughs> Obelias is sort of a, a penny loaf and, and sort of on and on and on. Right. I was going to ask where, if those were, if they were generally standalone words or whether they were generally compounds, because of course, Greek is very happy to just compound you can right. get it's both. 85 words out of out of one with they it, do both right okay. it, it's both some of them some of them are you know the tarantos artos is a cheese loaf mm -hmm. but other ones the the obelios seems to have been named after the obel right after the shape of it or something. right yeah. so it's either the shape or the cost Oh, right, of course. And and so we actually hear that, well, we hear alternate definitions. Is it baked on a spit? Is it the cost? Or or is it the shape of the loaf? And if it's baked on a spit, there's some suggestion that this is the really cheap stuff. So it could be mm. cost as, as well. Sort of street food. But if yeah. it's baked on spit, it could just be stuck in the ashes and then pulled out that way. Right. <laughs> okay, let's get to some sort of basics then. Obviously, you've just finished telling us that they ate all sorts of different <laughs> kinds of breads <laughs> and cooked them in all sorts of different ways. But, you know, if you're going to talk about bread as social class or bread of status, mm -hmm. too, because that's key, it, you know, are there some broad delineations you can make? Who ate what kinds of grains? What sorts of foods would be, you know, the people we think of as Greeks be more likely to eat compared to the people who actually were the majority of the Greeks? That kind of stuff. <laughs> Yeah, so that, that's a really, really important question. It's one that I've only really started to dig into. And I think here, the first thing to recognize is that there's a significant difference between the imaginary foodscape right. and the actual foodscape. Right. I suspect that the actual foodscape is closer than a lot of our sources are presenting. That most people ate more broadly similar yes. stuff, regardless yes. of class. Yeah. Yeah. You know, unless you're at some sort of feast. And mm -hmm. yes, we have accounts of those as well, including some from Athenaeus. There are two people. One of them is Linkius of Samos, and the other one's, oh, I'm blanking on the guy's name at the moment, but he's a Macedonian and he's heading out uh, into the, the world from the academy. And his his buddy Linkia says, "Hey, you should write to me about all the feasts that you go to." And so, like, we know that there are some some pretty ostentatious feasts happening mm -hmm. uh, as well. But for you know, if you're a generic farmer, you're probably not eating wildly yeah. different things. The biggest difference between most of the people living in Greece and say anybody who's at least partially affluent. Mm -hmm. is that if you're partially affluent, I bet you're eating more bread. And the difference there is that for the poorest of the poor, you're probably eating porridge rather than bread. Right. Uh, because right. again, it comes to the food sources and the grinding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And it's a matter of time the, the and, heat and sources, everything sorry, else. Heat sources, yeah. yeah, heat sources, uh, it's a matter of time and also processing. Mm -hmm. You know, if you just throw some barley into some water and heat it up a little bit and, and you know, break it down a little bit, you can just eat it as a porridge. Yeah. Yeah, and grinding you know, grain. You, you need to do much you know, it's more. Very slow yeah. and labor intensive process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. It yeah. gets much more complicated the the more you you have to do to it. Mm -hmm. But that being said, I actually do think a lot of people, even relatively poor people, you know, not the not the enslaved people working at Laurion, say, mm -hmm. but you know, I think even relatively poor people are probably eating bread. And. We also have some accounts of people, soldiers, for instance, mm -hmm. making their own little cakes and baking them just on the campfire. And so, you know, these are relatively easy things, things to make. For the most part, then, the vast majority of somebody's diet is grain. Mm -hmm. And that's true across the spectrums, except for the richest of the rich. Right. And, and that's simply a matter, like, that's just a, a calculation uh, mm -hmm. uh, of calories. You know, if, you know, if you, you know, the people ate meat, people ate fish, mm -hmm. but fish is super expensive mm -hmm. and, you know, you have to be crazy uh, rich in order to do it. There's Coralus of Samos was allegedly paid a retainer of four minai a day. So an exorbitant retainer. Mm -hmm. And he spent the whole thing buying fish because he just mm -hmm. loved fish that much. <laughs> but most people aren't like that. 
yeah. most people are, are having some meat, something cooked, some cheese, some, you know, wine as, as, as a standard, but then your base food is is bread or is grains of some sort. Mm-hmm. And this roughly corresponds to the Greek practice in terms of a diet. You have a tripartite diet, your sitos, which is your grain, mm-hmm. ideally wheat, which I'll get to in a, a moment, opson, which is cooked food, ideally meat, but also fish, and then wine. Mm-hmm. The meat's expensive, you know, because it spoils relatively quickly. Also because it's just expensive to raise an animal and then slaughter it and not have mm-hmm. it the next year. Yeah. Yeah. There's um, a lot of other uses you can put animals to. Right. And so I think for most people, not everyone, but most people, you're having your meat primarily at festivals, mm-hmm. either the state sponsored festivals in Athens or, you know, we're at a wedding. Yeah. Uh, or, yeah. And, and, and there's a, and there's a lot of, I mean, there's, Relatively right. speaking, a fair number of festivals in any Absolutely. given year. At, a, at so you're, you're not going to be place. deprived of your meat. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. There's a ton of festivals. You're not deprived of your meat for that reason, but you're also not, you know, having bacon every morning mm-hmm. and then, you know, ham sandwich at lunch and then a steak at dinner. Like, yeah. That's just not happening. We seem to get a good sense that there seems to have been things like sausages and stuff. So the idea yeah. that you might have like one piece of smoked sausage that you can cut up into your cooked greens or whatever seems like like a doable thing but that's not the same as eating meat as your food <sighs> yeah yeah the the consum- meat consumption is much higher today than it was yeah. uh, then but yeah you're right you know you can have small amounts as, as sort of flavoring and things but then when we break this down most people you know if you get sort of a truth serum and talk <laughs> to the average greek person in antiquity you know they would say oh yeah no i i prefer wheat bread because yeah. that's the good stuff and probably was better but it also is true that's higher calorie mm-hmm. most of them were probably eating barley for a lot of their their meals and that it's simply a cost issue mm-hmm. you know there's more of it available and so they sort of poo-poo it as like that's what you feed the horses but you know people were eating it and people were eating quite a lot of it right <laughs> uh but then there's also a relatively big difference Yes, in terms of class, but also in terms of urban versus rural. Okay, yeah. And rural people, people who are living on farms, seem to have had a wider range of food in their diet. Mm-hmm. You know, more access to greens, more access to hunted food, having animals around. Also, if you're living out there on, on you know, a big estate or, you know, if you own an estate, well, you're rich. Yeah. <laughs> that that helps too. Mm-hmm. Whereas in the city, one of the things that has to be considered, and this is where those studies had always started with, where are you getting your food? Mm-hmm. How are you bringing it in? And if you, for instance, read about the American Midwest in you know around 1900, 1890, 1900, in places like Chicago, the cities were disgusting. Mm-hmm. Because they were shipping in on rail cars, cattle, <laughs> and then slaughtering them in the city. Mm-hmm. Well, we do have evidence for butchers, and like Flint Dibble's been doing a lot of work on sacrificed yeah. animals and things yeah. like that. But, you know, these animals in the city always pose a problem. <laughs> they poop everywhere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, they have a lot of blood you have to mm-hmm. try and capture that so you can use it somehow but like there's a lot of stuff going on mm-hmm. and then once you have done the slaughtering you have to dispose of that meat relatively quickly mm-hmm. otherwise it's going to spoil mm-hmm. so what seems to have happened is that the simply the mechanics of a pre-modern the logistics of a pre-modern economy bringing in food seem to have encouraged more grain consumption for people simply living in the city. Right. Because that's a much more manageable product. It's pretty new. It it's spoil pretty nutritious. as much. It doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't spoil. cause yeah. waste. It doesn't, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then a lot of our evidence for stuff, stuff like this comes from, from Athens. And we're told that places like Athens and Rhodes had better bread. Yeah. And... The, there are several reasons for this. Economies of scale. I, I suspect that plays a difference when you're grinding a lot of grain. Mm-hmm. But also they 
are hubs in the green trade. So yeah. Rhodes is on the route from Egypt, and Athens, right. you know, pretty aggressively uh, <laughs> controlled the grain trade into the Aegean, so that grain ships coming from the Bosporus had to go to Athens before they could go anywhere else. Mm-hmm. And so Athens That's is getting the, basically the, the first the dibs. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And as a result, you get newer grain, and so it, it typically is better grain. Mm-hmm. And so that the grain coming from the Black Sea is going to be, you talked a while back about different strains of, of wheat. Uh-huh. Maybe we can explore that a little bit because so barley, I, I'm sure barley has changed over the years too, but people don't eat a lot of barley now and they don't really have a good sense probably of what barley flour is like. I mean, I have baked with it and I've used <laughs> it in a few things, but probably it's a little unfamiliar to a lot of people. But we all think we know wheat because we're used to it. But if you don't do bread baking on a fairly detailed scale, you might not have thought very much about flour <laughs> in the yeah. past. So what, you know, I know the wheat we have now is an extremely different beast than the wheat in the ancient world yes. in some ways. Uh, so what, you know, what were the basic wheats they were using and what were their properties? Right. So there seemed, there seemed to be two. And, and I should preface this with like, this is something I'm working towards. I, yeah. actually, I, I want to recover a lot of this, but I haven't been able to get into the field and, and really <laughs> dig into to this. And I also like, why. <laughs> as, a, as an amateur baker, this is also something I'm still learning mm-hmm. about. Yeah, me um, very much too. <laughs> this is something I'm and, interested and so, in but haven't done a lot with. And, and, and so like, here, here's the thing about modern grains. Most people, when they go, you know, flour, mm-hmm. well, they think you know, I'm going to go down to the grocery store and I'm going to get a bag of milled gold metal flour or Pillsbury flour or something. Mm -hmm. Or even if you're like me and, you know, I typically get King Arthur flour, partly home state loyalty. And and partly I think they put out a very good product. Mm -hmm. Uh, What you're getting is a fairly homogenous thing from one or two strains of wheat. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're getting this picture that it's all one thing. But if you start to look around at artisanal granaries, mm-hmm. you know, farms and like mills, the one that I've been sourcing a lot of my stuff from is uh, Janie's Mill in Illinois. Okay. What you'll find is that they actually have flowers from a half dozen or a dozen different varietals of wheat. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they are all going to have different qualities in terms of texture, how much water they absorb, different milling techniques. For instance, you can get a whole wheat that is unbolted, that still has a lot of the bran in it, or you can have bolted, which is the bolting just takes out the bran. And so it's a much smoother product. Mm -hmm. You can also get Bob's Red Mill, for instance, does spelt which mm-hmm. is an ancient grain that I quite like. It sort of has a nutty flavor. And so... And they, and they something... differ in their protein content, which is a really important. Yeah. Gluten. yeah. Yeah. And they range from, so on the low end, 8 9% protein up to about 15% mm-hmm. percent protein, which is, you know, that's a pretty significant difference. And, and so they're going to add texture. They're going to add flavor. They're going to change how strong the dough is mm-hmm. because ultimately what bread is, is the, you know, the kneading creates gluten uh, in the flour and water mixture, the the gluten forms and and traps air inside of it. And then that puffy thing that has the air trapped inside of it is bread. Mm -hmm. Um, Or as bread as we think of it, because barley really doesn't do that. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, barley is its own own challenge. And definitely is going to shape what bread looks like in antiquity. So I just mentioned spelt. It's relatively mm-hmm. low protein flour. It does exist. We do know of it. Xenophon talks about it in the Anabasis. He sees, okay. uh, I think it was uh, a field of spelt. But the two big ones that the Greeks liked to get their hands on, the ones that were told are the best, mm-hmm. are the Egyptian grain, which mm-hmm. is the ancestor of modern Durham flour which is what okay. you usually use for pasta. And the stuff from the Bosporus is probably the ancestor of like hard winter wheat, which are like right. the, the red wheats that usually are turned into bread flour today. Ultimately, the difference between a lot of these beyond flavor and beyond sort of ease of use 
and you know protein content, which is a little hard to recover these days, is that in Egypt, is that they are fundamentally different flowers. That's what mm -hmm. I should say. In Egypt, you have multiple growing seasons. And so you get a lot of harvests, right. which encourages more and more and more mutations in, in the grain, which mm. ultimately what this does is it creates bigger kernels, wheat kernels, and it makes them easier to pry apart. And these are sort of the big challenges that you're you're trying to uncover because that's going to make it easier to get at the interior of the grain, the, the wheat berry, and turn that into flour. The ancestor of the hard winter wheat probably was a higher protein but mm -hmm. even though they talk about these two as being the best, they don't actually seem to distinguish between them. Mm. And so as far as I can tell, and, and this is something that I am desperately wanting to get further into, is that these are close enough, at least to the naked eye, that they are fundamentally or functionally the same, I right. should say. Right. That they're treated as equivalent, whatever right. their actual difference is. Right. Hmm. Okay. So those are, but those are reasonably high protein. Those are reasonably high gluten. Mm -hmm. So you're going to get some essentially stone ground. Yep. <laughs> that was stone ground in the ancient world anyway. <laughs> Not a lot of steel milling going on. Stone ground flour. So you're going to get what we would consider whole wheat flour. Even their whitest yes. flour is probably going to be. A pretty whole wheat to our eyes. Yes. Uh, I yeah. mean, the handful that aren't, and Pliny the Elder talks about this at mm -hmm. one point. If you get a wheat that's too white, it's probably not that you actually have a white flour. What you probably have is somebody who took some sort of chalk and dyed it. <laughs> Adulterated uh. it. Like the 19th century, 18th and 19th century breads in England that are so yeah. famously poor. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Okay. So you got some sort of whole wheat esque wheat. If you leaving aside barley for the moment, did well actually. Let me just ask: Did they mix barley and wheat? Like, was that a thing? I have not been or, able to find any recipes that combine them. Which is so interesting to me because you'd think it would be an obvious way of stretching your wheat to make now, like an acceptable leavened loaf. Now by this using very well. Barley. Yeah. This very well could be an instance of uh, we just don't have the evidence for it. Right. People um, are just not going to talk about it because you don't want to say you have to stretch your wheat. Say. Right. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, you, I mean, you're absolutely right. I have not found any of the recipes that that talked about it. It's either mm -hmm. this is a, a barley loaf or this is a wheat loaf. Okay. No, that's interesting. Even if, you know, whatever they were doing on the ground, that's right. a meaningful thing to see in in their sort of classification system of what bread was like. Yeah. Of course, when you're talking about recipes, especially if you're talking about actual written out recipes, you can talk about that. And perhaps at some point, your, your evidence is pretty limited and very specific to certain yeah. classes. <laughs> yeah. And, and I've not seen any any specific recipes. These are just descriptions of different breads with a, a name. Right. And then here are the ingredients. Right. Right. And yeah, the, the, the salient points about them. All right. So you got that. And then. For the wheat ones, then, presumably, one imagines mm -hmm. they were always, at least to some degree, leavened. I don't know if they were. I mean, barley. Not, all, not, not always. I, I think that the idea would have been leavening is better. Yeah. You know, it creates you a more attractive bread. It also makes it sort of easier to digest, usually. Mm -hmm. It's softer. Better, but faster. Yeah. But I don't think that that is necessarily something we can guarantee. Mm. Now, there has been some work in Roman culture, a Tavola Mediterranea, and I'm blanking mm. on her name at the moment, but that's her site, has uh, done a whole bunch for Pharrell. Yes, that's right. Yeah, has done a bunch with, with Roman bakeries, where mm -hmm. she suggests that the breads were simply leavened by leaving them out overnight. Right, the doughs out before you, yeah. yeah. And, and that's probably true. And mm -hmm. Some of that probably happened in, in Greece. We just don't have the evidence for it. Right. And like we really don't have the extreme evidence for large-scale bakeries. You know, mm -hmm. in, in Rome, we get these big bakeries. Yeah. In Greece, we really don't. Okay. Which was one of the things that that originally got me really fascinated by this. You know, mm -hmm. we're always told, well, self-sufficiency, self-sufficiency, self-sufficiency. 
But then yeah. if you look at the archaeological record in places like Olynthus, they don't always have a, a hearth. They don't always have an oven. So if they're self-sufficient, how are they are cooking they, their food? <laughs> how are they doing? Maybe they're just doing it with a little portable thing. That's certainly yeah, possible. Like a, a... Maybe they're doing it outside. Maybe they're doing it communally. All of that is possible. But some houses, some residential places did, and some residential places didn't. Mm -hmm. And so what I started doing was looking around for evidence of who's actually baking this, mm -hmm. you know, who's actually doing this work. And what I found was actually really interesting. So on the one hand, we find that in these big self-sufficient, quote unquote, self-sufficient houses, <laughs> unsurprisingly, it's enslaved people. And we find out, again, from Athenaeus quoting Archistratus, that you should have a Phoenician or a Lydian mm -hmm. enslaved person doing this baking for you. Interesting. It's like, okay, so not just an enslaved person, but a very particular enslaved person mm -hmm. to do this. And the, the particular speaker in Athenaeus goes on to say, well, it's because he doesn't know that the best person comes from Cappadocia. <laughs> right. So th there may be some rhetorical stuff going on here about like showing uh, expertise and, and yeah, choose. that's the domestic side. But then we mm -hmm. also hear about Fiarion, who is specifically a baker. Right. So, so uh, that's uh, an art of yeah. And in Xenophon's Oikonomicus, we have an account of somebody who is running, who is basically making a killing by being a baker, by hmm. uh, run, owning a shop where enslaved people are doing this baking. So, okay. Right. So citizen men own these things, and they are the ones who are doing this baking and getting rich from this. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a starting point. But then I started yeah. working further, because it's never quite that simple. It's never the first <laughs> thing you find. So I started looking further, and I went to Athenian comedy, particularly Aristophanes. And there are some issues here. And what you find in Aristophanes is this really interesting cross-section of professions. And one of the professions that he finds is the baker, hmm. except that he doesn't usually, in these cases, he does not usually use the masculine. Hmm. It's usually a woman. Okay. Oh. And so we find, for instance, in the frogs, where they're having the, the poetry contest down in the underworld to figure <laughs> out what are they doing about it, Alcibiades. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the, the poets declares, you know, it isn't proper for men of poetry to be abused like breadwives, hmm. which is the, what I've been using for female bakers here, because ultimately they're sort of the stock type. There's a root stock type that's rather like the fishwife. Mm. The first time I ever uh, talked about this in front of people, I compared it to a scene in Anthony Bourdain's No Reservations, <laughs> where he went to Portugal, and he's he's just got B-roll of these two fishwives who are just the filthiest <laughs> uh, jokers. <laughs> They're just talking and talking about their husband and genitals and whatever. <laughs> and it ends up being sort of like that. Okay. In Aristophanes' wa uh, Wasps, two men who are, are on the jurors sort of reminisce about the time that they went wandering, stealing from a baker. We removed her tray or mortar, split it apart, and boiled our pimpernel. <laughs> like, oh, wait, okay, what? And then in also in the Wasps, there's a female litigant. Wait, if we're going by the most, you know, you know, mm -hmm tightest well, definition of it all women are supposed be to be bringing court cases yeah. but there's yeah. a female litigant and she goes that there is the man who lay waste to me striking me with his torch knocking 10 obeloy off the trays tray and four more besides hmm. so okay she so she's selling she, she's yeah. selling bread and she's bringing a court case against somebody Mm. And then in Lysistrata's army, in, in Lysistrata, we have the garlic tavern bakery keepers who are women. <laughs> right. And so we can start pulling this apart and going, wait, we have all these women who are doing this work. Mm -hmm. And they seem to have the equipment to actually do the baking on top of simply selling it. They're bringing mm -hmm. the, the you know, case to the, the magistrate. <laughs> they're, they're Which also means they're not the enslaved stuff. people. Right. 
yeah right than, or even the, foreigners are, necessarily yeah. yeah right and it's funny that you should mention foreigners because then if you if we pull back even further so we're like okay well there are definitely some citizen men who are operating these things but we also mm-hmm. have female bread bakers and bread sellers who are interacting with the magistrates and with the men you know we, we always mm-hmm. get this picture we're always told about the athenian women who are supposed to cover up and never go outside and on yeah, and on yeah. and on and it's like that that was not true <laughs> but then we have this whole picture of them in in business but then this one thing that i'm most fascinated by it's probably my favorite inscription from ancient greece is an honorary inscription from athens in 401 after the fall of the 30 tyrants and it is giving honors you know probably tax honors to these foreigners who fought alongside the revolution to restore the democracy Mm, okay and on this list we get a couple of bakers one of them he's my favorite, is this guy named Abdes, which that A-B-D-E-S, that doesn't sound like a Greek name. Yeah, that's definitely not. (laughs) You know, that sounds like, oh, I don't know, somebody from Mm Syria-ish, possibly. And then we also have another one, Pydikos, which sounds quite a bit like an enslaved person's name that had been given to them, Mm -hmm. who's also listed as uh, an Artokoyos. So we get you know, these people who are operating in the Piraeus, probably mm-hmm. not in Athens proper, but in this port where they can uh, operate the, their bakeries and they're selling bread, we get these women bakers. And then, you know, we do have a couple of accounts of potentially citizen men owning these these businesses. Mm-hmm. But, you know, once we start looking for it, bread is everywhere. <laughs> it also shows up in metaphors, but it's everywhere. The people who are doing the bread selling are everywhere. And they're a much more interesting cross-section of Athenian society than just going, oh yeah, well, some rich men owned some bakeries and got rich on it. Right. And definitely, it's not that each household is making their own bread every morning for their own family. But like that, oh, absolutely some not. people are, of course, but most people probably aren't. That's just, yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. Okay, I have two things I want to ask about, and you can decide which way you want to go. One is I want to ask, I want to pick up on the metaphors about bread a bit and talk a little bit about the importance of bread in that imaginary rather than real world and ask you to talk a little bit about that. And then the other piece that I want to talk about a little bit more is how much sort of attempts at making ancient bread have you done? You know, what have you done or are you doing or would you like to do in terms of that kind of experimental archaeological approach to, to bread making? So you pick. Well, I can, answer, like to start with? I can answer. I can answer both of those. The answer to the second one is um, fairly, you know, straightforward. Okay. I want to do as much as I can. Mm-hmm. I have not done very much. You know, it's one of those instances that my brothers, who, like I said, also bake, have been taunting me and going, "You know, I expected more by now." <laughs> um, but, All right. So you have yeah. a, a strong incentive, is what you're saying. <laughs> Right. It, 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 it's more been an issue of time and, mm-hmm. and money. I, I know this is not a, a, a academic, you know, kind of employment podcast, but, you know, the, <laughs> the fact is that being contingent has made things mm-hmm. very, very difficult to yeah. get this project really going. Yeah. And I fully intend to do a bunch of reconstructions. Some of it will be taking those different types of bread and just experimenting, you know, mm-hmm. being like, all right. I know what I'm doing when it comes to baking modern bread. Let's just see what I can do. Mm-hmm. It might not be perfect, but I'm going to, you know, keep it as close as I can. Mm-hmm. I would love to work with specialty bakeries, for instance, in Ann Arbor or King Arthur Flour in Norwich, Vermont, or wherever, mm-hmm. to do some reconstructions. You know, find, you know, work with Janie's Mills even to see if we can do some reconstructions of specific types of saddle mills for right. grinding. Uh, the grain for trying to to figure out as close as we can what types of of wheat they were using to make ovens to to see what I can do because I think that that hands-on component would be really necessary but at the moment that's not been possible yet so that's all all in the future question about that then would you then would you want to rely on wild yeast as you said they would just leave their lo- loaf out overnight for in terms of leavening. Uh, I would experiment with it a couple of different ways. For leavening, I, I use a sourdough starter for all of my home bakes. I would not use that 
for this. What I would do is the, the closest thing I've known of that was a particular source that mentions throwing leftovers from yesterday's bread into today's bread to mm-hmm. leaven it. And so I would do that a couple of different ways. You know, once I had ancient breads, quote unquote, I would try throwing actual baked bread, probably Mm -hmm. a baked cake cake of some sort in to see what happened. I would throw, I would save some of the dough and throw that in. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would leave it out overnight. However that works. I I would absolutely do all of that. I would not use a sourdough starter simply because I don't have any evidence that they actually kept sourdough starters. Yeah, because that is a... A more complicated thing, an actual making yeah. starter, yeah. And, and to be perfectly frank, it's more wasteful. Oh yeah, it's when I've done sourdough. So I, I've gone through batches of sourdough bre- mm-hmm. baking, and I a hundred percent refuse to do it the way that any of the books tell me to do it because I will not throw out starter. So I just <laughs> don't do that. And I, I, you know, it's we, we fine. I make perfectly we, decent. Yeah, I, we, we should talk. I, 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 I don't. I don't throw out my any of my starter, and I don't use it for anything else either. I basically feed feed for a bit, make a bread with it, stick the rest uh, of the fridge until I'm ready for it, and it it works fine. Yeah, if you can refresh it straight from the fridge, though. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is what I actually do. I've been using the same starter for five or six years now. One in the wait. fridge right now that I haven't touched in six months and I'm, I'm or four months. Maybe You're probably going to need and to replace that one. Yeah, probably. <laughs> but well, we'll see. Cause I, I did one that I went right. from, I think from June of last year to, I started again in October or something and I pulled it out. I was like, there's no way this is going to work, but I yeah, poured up I, that black liquid and I stirred it up and it was fine. <laughs> I, I, I bake roughly twice a week when I'm going well, I bake four or five times a week, but right during the semester it's probably about twice a week yeah then you aren't um, going to be wasting starter cause and and i don't yeah, waste yeah. anything of it i just refresh uh, about mm-hmm. once a week so anyway. like i wouldn't be doing anything like that mm-hmm. i think we also have at least one account of leavening using wine must right because that's um, definitely something that comes up in the roman sources is yeah. wine mm-hmm. must and yeah and other and things that make it sound mm-hmm. like they're they are using kind of dried yeast sort of ideas too. yeah and so I, I would try stuff like that as well there's actually mm-hmm. a really interesting baker in france who reconstructed the method that was being used by french bakers behind the lines during world war one which oh, involved harvesting yeast from raisins Right. Uh, right. So ba- Which, basically, he took raisins, threw it in water, left it for two days, and then mm-hmm. used the water to bake bread. Yeah, because I've seen that in, in one mm-hmm. of the books I have seen it, that as a suggestion for sourdough starters, like when you first start your sourdough. Super if you start easy. it from scratch, throw a couple of raisins in and it'll it'll perk your yeah. bread up. It, it's super easy and gets the, gets mm-hmm. the yeast. So I, I would try all of these things. And, and yeah, a lot of our, our sources for this stuff are coming from the Roman era, but they are many of them also do look back to ancient Greece and, and talk about Greek methods versus other methods. And there does seem to be long-term persistence because let's be serious here. What I'm doing to bake bread has a couple of different technologies that, are, that make it easier for me, but it's not actually really all that different from what people yeah. have been doing for thousands of years. Yeah, yeah. The the substance hasn't changed that much when you're doing it at home. Yeah. So like that that's the experimental side. I would I would love to do it. Briefly on the metaphors, I've got one in, in front of me, but they, they start popping up more than you might think when you start looking for them. And it's this really weird account in Herodotus where you know he's talking about tyrants and, and this is the other thing, is that like the range of people and the range of of contexts in which bread show up and the number of people who seem to know about the process or know about the Mm -hmm. the tools you know is is striking i I think that that this is not something where you get segregation between between genders but anyway in herodotus he's talking about the tyrant periander who very infamously committed necrophilia and herodotus describes this as Periander throwing his loaves into a cold oven. And so we get (laughs) bread baking as a metaphor for sex. Mm -hmm. For, um, which is just for, for, for non-progenitive sex, right? Like that's the, well, well, that's the, that's the cold oven. Yeah. That's what I mean. That's presumably if you throw it into a warm oven, then bread bread baking is just sex. 
Yeah. <laughs> And, and so you can start to find these things in, in language. And one of the things that I discovered, and this was true of the types of bread, and this was certainly true of, of the civilization stuff, the glossographers, mm-hmm. on and on and on. Bread is everywhere in, in the Greek language. You know, mm-hmm. It shows up sort of all over the place. The, the metaphor I was thinking of coming from a literary perspective, the one that is the most famous perhaps is the eaters of bread as mm-hmm. mortal as opposed in, yeah. in contrast to the gods um, yeah. that sort of is the defining factor of, of, of yeah. Humans. And I think that's, that, that's certainly related to this mm-hmm. sort of commentary about civilization versus the uncivilized, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. the, the eaters of bread are, are a very particular type of mortal mm-hmm. because then if, if the people below eat human things, but they're not settled, yeah, they're not they gods, their, but they're, yeah, they don't they're grow their eating. grain. And then the, the gods also don't. But yeah, we get this nice swath right in the middle. Is there any Greek equivalent to Latin companio? And that that has that sense of, you know. Someone who you break bread with? Someone you break bread with. That is a great question. Not that I can come up with off the top of my head, but I'm going to have to look into that. Because you do see a similar thing in in English with uh, the word mate is etymologically related to meat. And so it's the same idea of sharing yeah. food with someone as... And as, meat didn't mean meat either. No, That's it meant it, was, it used to be a general word for food. Mm-hmm. And it could really yeah, which is something that I, I, I belatedly learned because one of my pet peeves is, is older translations that translate sitos or grain as, as meat. Meat. Because, you know, there are these, these modifications. My... my mm-hmm. Least favorite moment of that is in Thomas Hobbes's tra- uh, translation of Thucydides. He talks about the women who go to Plataea to dress the meat for the the defenders, which is just you know to my mind it just like broke my brain because <laughs> no this, these women went there to bake bread. Yeah, right. And using the phrase, <laughs> putting the phrase "dress" in there really is to like, to, to dress the meat. It really does like. You can't yeah. turn that into if they if you even just said prepare the meat you'd be like okay fine meat is grain fine but yeah <laughs> yeah you don't dress yeah uh, but yeah, yeah it shows up all over the place so yeah the the only things that I can come up with off the top of my head for Greek lean more towards drinking together yeah I was gonna mm. say that that the the wine but it's not eating it's mm-hmm. not bread. But but yeah, the drinking together is much more common and, and frankly seems to have been, you know, in terms of social institutions, the, the more sort of important thing, the bread is mm-hmm. sort of the fabric of society. And then, you know, how do you sort of engage with your, your fellow people? Well, you go drink with them. Mm-hmm. Though in, if you look, and I can't think of a word or any of the terminology, but if you look back to the Homeric stuff, uh, mm-hmm. The food there becomes very key, whether it's grain in the yeah. drink or the bread, right? The, and I, I've always, one of the things that interests me about that is the bread that they bake in those very formulaic and quite probably not in any way reflective of actual practice. So granted, but those formulaic, not the feast, but the, the scenes where they sit down together, where somebody yeah. welcomes them to your tent. They always talk about grinding the grain, mixing it, baking it, and then serving the rolls, you know, the, the fresh baked bread. Yeah. Which you know, definitely means they're not fresh baked bread the way my brain yeah. wants them to be because they're not like crusty. <laughs> well, risen well they're not, yeah, they're not leavening. No, you know, and you, and they you, may you well don't. be sticking it on a stick and roasting it in the fire because yeah. they don't have ovens in their in the camps on the shores of of. But um, I mean, but I mean, Jordan. it would be super quick yeah. because in Jewish custom, when you're making matzah for you know fresh matzah for Passover, you have to go from the moment the water hits the grain until the moment it's out of there in the oven in 17 minutes or the whole process has to be completed in 17 minutes. Is that to make sure there's no leavening whatsoever happening? Yes. Yeah, to I make sure there's no leavening that. whatsoever. You know, of course I, I contend I'm sure there's ritual be, reasons behind the time. And yeah. Stuff, but yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it's to stop the leavening. I joke sometimes that I should be able to use my sourdough starter. Cause of course you don't want to leave it behind in Egypt. We don't want to leave it for the Egyptians. That's a good <laughs> starter. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, it's 17 minutes. And so, mm. yeah, I mean, you can imagine that if you're not going to be leavening, you absolutely could do a, well, you probably want it a little bit ground, but, you know, in half an hour, you could have mm. a, a fresh 
role to give somebody as a part of a welcome. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and, and like, I, I mentioned and Bannock like, yes, before. It is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, how I think of Bannock is, I mean, Bannock is camp bread, which you, yes, you mm-hmm. normally ground the flour already and modern recipes have baking powder in them and things like that, but no way that's what the, <laughs> what people were using. Bannock yeah. is just, is you literally wrap it around a stick and bake it in the fire and it takes you 10 minutes. It's not Yeah. And, and, not and so, you know, it's tasty. Yeah. It's super easy, super fast. And and so you could absolutely imagine that something like that in the Homeric poems is simultaneously literary and formulaic and all, all the mm-hmm. rest, but it's also like not out of the realm of possibility. Yeah. I mean, it has to have some connection to, to real life or yeah. it would just be meaningless to, to its original audience. But I bring that up because while I can't think of a term that is involved there, that is very clearly, you know, a, a, an important social yes. bonding thing that's going on yes. at which it seems that you need to have the meat and, um, yeah. and you need to have the bread and you need to have the wine. And all right. three and, of and those do... things are there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we definitely know that people are dining together and that there are dining groups and, and things. It's just the ones that sort of bubble to the top in terms of what words they're, they're using for things mm-hmm. seem to or be a little related. bit closer to the drinking together than eating together, even though you're absolutely right. It, it mm-hmm. happened and, you know, I don't want to downplay its importance. No, no, I know. Even, I'm, I'm even if some of the accounts to that look got, for it. Yeah. yeah. Places to look for yeah. it because that is a, you know, a specifically not just a fan, like those aren't family groups, right? Because yes. obviously most people are just eating in family groups. That's what we see with this symposium pattern is that you eat in your family yeah. group and then you go drink together. But when you're talking about the sort of formal guest friendship stuff and all of that, yeah. that's a different different situation. Yeah. yeah. And and yeah. rituals and, and the like. And and like we do know that there are specific breads that are made for specific things. You know, the the women when they go off to women's only festivals bake special breads for them. Yeah. Sometimes yeah, and, and in so the like, shape you know, of very not... interesting things. <laughs> sometimes yes, sometimes no, but sometimes yes. Uh, so those are the ones yeah, that make so, it into the stories. <laughs> yes, of course, but they are very much important things, and they're connected mm-hmm. to ritual and and mm-hmm. social gatherings and 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 all the rest. And yeah, bread is just uh, everywhere. When you think talk about pet peeves of translation, mine. <laughs> has always been the i mean i could pet pe- pe- people a long time but mine is the corn and mm-hmm. maybe it's worth bringing up just because in case anyone else has ever been baffled by yeah. the bizarre prevalence of corn in the ancient world but i mean it's such a north american problem i know it's modern north americans who are the problem here the rest of the yeah, world it, is perfectly it, able it, to, to to see corn as just <laughs> meaning great yeah uh, it, it it definitely baffled me the the first oh, time i came across that in college it took me a, an embarrassingly long time to realize <laughs> to finally kind of notice it and think no like yeah, it's, in my so, mind it wasn't just that it was corn in my mind it was corn on the cob really? i don't know how long it took me to realize that yeah. no even you know that they were not shipping <laughs> cobs yes. of corn from the black sea to Athens. oh that that would be Egypt a, it, that, that would that would be a fantastic story though <laughs> would, would it not but yeah no the, the what what even's of oh, course yeah. referring to is that corn the way that most North Americans think about it is is actually maize. It's mm-hmm. a grain that was domesticated in southern Mexico or, or Central yeah. America and then became the dominant grain in, in the Americas and has since become one of the dominant grains in the entire world, having spread through European colonialism, mm-hmm. basically, and, and various Spanish trade routes. But it is also an antiquated term for wheat, an, an older term specifically for any grain that was shipped around and so you'll see a lot of translations that talk about you know the corn trade instead of yeah the, the corn trade. supply the corn <laughs> supply at rome right like you do roman history and they talk about the corn supply at rome all the time and it just it took me so long to sort of I mean, what, what you don't, go, wait, what, you, what are they talking about the corn supply? I don't, that can't what, be what see, I what you, the corn laws. What, what you don't, or the corn laws, laws in the 19th century <laughs> England. Again, same what, what, deal. What, I'm like, it wasn't laws about <laughs> corn on the corn. See, what you don't realize is that when they said, you know, bread and circuses and they're handing out corn at, and the corn dole at yeah. the Coliseum, <laughs> what they're really doing is handing around uh, buckets of popcorn. Yeah, <laughs> buckets of popcorn at actual circuses. <laughs> it makes like, total <laughs> sense. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I know. And it's not the fault of the early translator. It's, it's a completely oh. reasonable word to use because, in fact, if you yes. said wheat, you would be lying because, yes, they did. They were getting wheat because it's not or whatever, just it's not that always one wheat. thing. Like, yeah, grain is the right word and corn is a perfectly reasonable word. Anyway, your comment about meat made me remember my, <laughs> my ongoing yes. bafflement about that. That is certainly one that, that <laughs> shows up all the time. Well, I think we could probably talk 
modern <laughs> baking for quite a while. But I think we've talked for a while, and I think this is probably a good place to leave it for now. But Fantastic. Anytime you want to have me back to talk modern baking, I've been experimenting with pizza recipes, so mm. I'd be happy to talk. Very good. Okay, well, we'll keep that <laughs> promise. Well, and in fact, fingers crossed for a bunch of different reasons that you get the time and resources to put towards some experimental <laughs> baking in the next little while. And if you do manage to do some, then that would be a fabulous chance to have you back to talk about to see what you're are. able to yeah. do and, and what you've been able to, to share. I love the idea Beautiful. of partnering with, with a mill to, you know, and a bakery. And then mm. I don't know how much you've talked with people like Matt Gibbs at, uh, he was at Manitoba. He's now in, in Edmonton, who did a lot of stuff with Roman beer and ancient beer. Yeah. Once I get going, he's going to be one of the people I need to talk to. Yeah. Because uh, he partnered with a brewery and I thought it was yeah. a really brilliant project to, and way of doing it because doing things like selling your, you know, recreational, recreational, recreated loaves is Absolutely. Uh, a, a really interesting idea. So yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's something I would very much love to do. I mean, the sort of trajectory of this project, as far as I'm concerned, hopefully will be a book, mm. uh, a commodity history of bread in, in ancient right. Greece that really takes you from farm to table and the, the whole nine yards, you know, getting into all of these different aspects because it is this foundational fundamental thing. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I originally got the idea for partnering with people about six, seven years ago because I read a book on milling in antiquity and he had actually gotten a fellowship a scholarship mm -hmm. from, I think it was the Miller's Association of Scotland or something like that. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, to, you know, to do this research oh, in, into milling technologies. <laughs> and it would just be a, a, a delight to mm -hmm. work with all of these different ones, especially mm -hmm. in this moment where artisanal bakeries are really having a renaissance in the United mm -hmm. States, along mm -hmm. with other aspects of food culture. Yeah, for sure. And so it would, of course, be my pleasure if, if and when this project really gets underway to come back and, and give an update. Yeah, that'd be great. Well, in the meantime, where can people find you? And if there's any other things coming up, I know you're working on a book, <laughs> but I don't want to hold you to a, a production schedule on that. But <laughs> if there's anything coming up well, and where that, can that book has to be delivered to soon. You? So, yeah, as we said at the beginning, I've got a, a bunch of different academic interests and I'm working on a variety of projects connected to ancient Ionia, also some stuff on Alexander the Great. You can find me on most social media platforms. That is not Facebook, but most other ones at JP Newdell being my last name. And then I also keep a blog. The, the link to that website is available on my, my Twitter account. And I write regularly, mostly about books I read, but also a whole a variety of other things. At the moment, after this particular school year, it's going to be mostly rest and, re and recovery this summer, mm -hmm. but hopefully there'll be some new projects coming down the pipeline later. Great. Well, we'll keep an eye on that. Yeah. I I find the information and the, the book reviews on the blog very interesting as someone who never <laughs> gets time to read books anymore, it seems. <laughs> I rely on other people doing so. <laughs> Tell me about that. Yeah. So thank you for uh, that. <laughs> absolutely. Well, thank you for chatting with us. That was a lot of fun. And we'll see you on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Well, as always, see you online. Yes. Thanks. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at Alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.